when people use the word common sense, what they mean is uncommon sense, because the standard human condition is ignorance and stupidity. It really is. The standard human condition is a lot of miscognition. You can improve your own life by eliminating your miscognitions. You know, the economy sometimes booms and sometimes it doesn't. And you have to live your life through both episodes. And our attitude is we just keep swimming and sometimes the tide is with us and sometimes against. But we keep swimming either way. Are you surprised by how long this expansion has lasted? Of course, it's lasted a long time. But what was really remarkable is we never printed money so much and spent it so fast and bought back so much debt, public and private. So this is total terra incognita in economics. And nobody knew for sure how it was going to work. Of course it was risky, but it worked. I don't think they had much else that would work. They weren't set up to do stimulus. Too much controversy, democratic inertia, is the very thing. So they had to do something. And all they had left was just to print money and start buying things. And that's what they did. And it turned out to be a very wise response. And what's even more remarkable is that both Congress and the presidency and under both parties made the same decision. They all cooperated. It was the last time. Well, it left us licking the Great Recession. So maybe we ought to try cooperation again since it worked so well once. If you're a politician in a democracy, of course, you want people to print money and spend it. And of course, it's not a good idea. The best example probably in the whole world is Singapore, which has zero debt and never prints money and spends it and is one of the most successful places on earth. I wish we were like that, but there's only one Singapore. Well, some people now say that federal debt is not a problem at all. Well, if you believe that, you believe in the tooth fairy, because then we don't have to have any more taxes ever. We'll just print money and live happily ever after. It obviously won't work. There comes a point when printing money is counterproductive. Are we at that point? Are you concerned? No, I don't think we are at that point, but nobody knew where the point was going to come, and we don't know now. None of these people who are so pompously sure of things because we all want reassurance and so they provide it. Nobody really knows how much of this is too much. It happened by accident. We were in desperate trouble. We were on the eve of a great recession that could have been a great depression and then followed by the rise of people like Adolf Hitler and so on and so on. So we faced a real catastrophe. The only weapon they had with this huge was to print money and spend it. And they did it and they drove interest rates down to zero, or real interest rates. Well, of course, that lifted asset values for the people who were already rich. Nobody was trying to make the rich richer. It just was an accidental byproduct of a correct governmental decision made on a bipartisan basis. And since it was a weird byproduct that occurred in a weird time, it will go away by itself in due course. I can't think of a single example in my whole life where Keeping it simple has worked against us. We've made mistakes, but they weren't because we kept it simple. We're trying to find intelligent things to do with a torrent of surplus cash. And we've always had a torrent of surplus cash. And we're always looking for intelligent things to do with it. And if we find things that are intelligent to do, we do it. And if we don't find anything, we let the cash build up. The hell's wrong with that? You know, the game in our kind of life is being able to recognize a good idea when you rarely get it and uh, rarely is presented to you. And I think that's something you have to prepare for over a long period. What is the old saying? That opportunity comes to the prepared mind. And I don't think you can teach people in two minutes how to have a prepared mind. But that's the game. Things we learned 40 years ago, though, will help in recognize the next and big on, idea. And on opportunity costs, going back to that, the current freshman economics text, which is sweeping the country, has right in practically the first page, and it says all intelligent people should think primarily in terms of opportunity cost, and that's obviously correct, but it's very hard to teach business based on opportunity cost. It's much easier to teach the capital assets pricing model, where you can just punch in numbers and outcome numbers. And therefore, people teach what is easy to teach instead of what is correct to teach. It reminds me of Einstein's famous saying. He says, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no more simple. Write that down. <laughs> Actually, I tend to be a follower of Confucius. And 
I think this room is full of Confucian values. <laughs> you know, if the first law of Confucianism is filial piety, particularly toward elderly males, you can see why I like that system. <laughs> obviously, considerations of cost are important in business. And obviously, opportunity costs, which is a doctrine of economics, really a doctrine of lifesmanship, are also very important. And we've always had that kind of basic thinking. Of course, capital isn't free. And of course, you can figure cost of capital when you're borrowing money, or at least you can figure cost of loans. But the theorists had to develop some theory for what equity cost. And there they just went bonkers. They said if you earned 100% on capital because you had some marvelous business, your cost of capital was 100%. And therefore, you shouldn't look at any opportunity that delivered a lousy 80%. That is the kind of thinking which came out of the capital assets pricing models and so forth that I've always considered inanity. What is Berkshire's cost of capital? We have this damn capital. It just keeps multiplying and multiplying. What is its cost? You have perfectly good old-fashioned doctrines like opportunity cost. At any given time when we consider an investment, we have to compare it to the best alternative investment we have at that time. We had perfectly good old-fashioned ideas that are very basic to use, but they weren't good enough for these modern theorists. So they invented all this ridiculous mathematics, which concluded that the companies that made the most money had the highest costs of capital. Well, all I can say is it's not for us. Now, the other half of that question I leave for Mr. Buffett. Yeah. <clears throat> what you find, of course, is that the cost of capital is about a quarter percent below the return promised by any deal that the CEO wants to do. Very simple. It, uh, you know, we have three questions with capital throughout, leaving aside whether we want to borrow money, which we generally don't want to do. One is, does it make it more sense to pay it out to the shareholders? than to keep it within the company. Sub-question on that is if we pay it out, is it better off to do it by a repurchases or by a dividend? The test for whether we pay it out in dividends is can we create more than a dollar of value within the company with that dollar than paying it out? And you never know the answer to that, but so far the answer is judged by results is yes, we can. And we think that prospectively we can, but that's a hope on our part, and it's justified to some extent by past history, but it's not a certainty. Once we've crossed that threshold, then do we repurchase stock? Well, obviously, if you can buy your stock at a significant discount from conservatively calculated intrinsic value and you can buy it in a reasonable quantity, that's a use for capital. Beyond that, then the question becomes, if you have the capital, you think you can create more than a dollar, how do you create the most with the least risk? And that gets to business risk. It doesn't get to any calculation of the volatility. I don't know the risk in C's candy as measured by its stock volatility because the stock hasn't been outstanding since 1972. Does that mean I can't? determine how risky a business seed is because we don't have a daily quote on it? No, I can determine it by looking at the business and the competitive environment in which it operates and so on. So once we cross the threshold of deciding that we can deploy capital so as to create more than a dollar of present value for every dollar retained, then it's just a question of doing the most intelligent thing that you can find. And that is the cost of every deal we do is measured by the second best deal that's around at a given time and doing more of some of the things we're already in. I have listened to cost of capital discussions at all kinds of corporate board meetings and everything else, and you know, I've never found anything that made very much sense in it, except for the fact that uh, it's what they learned in business school and it's what the consultants talked about, and most of the board members would nod their head without knowing what the hell was going on. At, uh, and that's been the, my history with the cost of capital. Now, moving on to the big ideas, you know when you've got a big idea, and I can't tell you, you know, exactly what happens within your nervous system or brain at that time, but we've had a relatively few big ideas, good ideas over the years. I don't know how many you think we've had in aggregate, probably maybe 25 each. If you took the top 15 out of Berkshire Hathaway, most of you people wouldn't be here. So roughly one every two yeah. years. Yeah, one every year or two. And sometimes there'll be a bunch of them, like in 1974 three and four. But the problem is for us is that big now really means big. I mean, it has to be billions of dollars to move the needle very much at Berkshire. I would say that when I would turn those pages 50 years ago in the Moody's manuals, I would know when I had a big idea. I've got a half a dozen of them that I keep the Xeroxes from those reports around from 50 years ago just because it was so obvious. They were incredible. And that happens every now and then. And when I met Warmer Davidson, you know, in end of January 1951, and he spent four hours or five hours with me explaining Geico. I knew it was a big idea. 
Eight months later, well, probably ten months later, I wrote an article to the Commercial and Financial Chronicle on the security I like best. It was a big idea. When I found Western Insurance Securities, I knew it was a big idea. They, you know, I couldn't put millions of dollars into it, but I didn't have millions, so it didn't make any difference. We've seen things subsequently, and we'll see, you know, we have a normal lifespan. We'll see a few more before we get done. Uh, actually, in one of my, well, I, I have a real system. My idea of a truly big idea is one I get and I call Charlie and he only says no, rather than that's the worst idea I've ever heard of. But if he just says no, it's a hell of an idea. Yeah. <laughs>